There is a saying that all good things come to an end. And that is true in this world. In fact, have you ever asked yourself the question whether the whole world as we know it could come to an end? And when that happens, will there be some people who will escape to a better country? And if so, who will they be? Stay tuned. We'll see. Welcome to Steps to Life with Dr. John Grossbaum. Sabbath rest is a promise between God and His children. Bible prophecy tells us that we are living in the last days of this earth's history before Jesus' second coming. Today's program will help you prepare for these coming events. Stay tuned. Thanks for joining us. Before we look at which people will one day escape from this world to a better country where there isn't any more pain or suffering or death, Let's pray that the Lord will help us to understand what we will read from His holy book. Father in heaven, we thank you for Bible prophecy. We thank you for the gospel. And we thank you for the history of our world that we find in the Bible that helps us to understand what will happen in the future. And we pray that as we read that you will give us an understanding mind by your spirit that we may be able to prepare and make decisions and be ready for what is going to come upon most of this world as an overwhelming surprise. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to today's program. We'd like to send you a free book entitled, The High Cost of the Cross. To receive this free book, simply call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for Offer ST51. How few of us understand the real meaning of Christ's suffering and death on the cross. We have only a dim comprehension of the conflict He passed through and the kind of agonizing death He experienced. Call 1-800-THE-TRUTH to order your free book. And now, Pastor John Grosball. The focal point of the last part of the book of Revelation is the three angels' messages. In fact, each chapter of the last several chapters of Revelation is devoted to showing you what will happen if you accept the three angels' messages or in what will happen to you at the end of the world if you reject the three angels' messages. The three angels' messages, by their very context and nature, if you read them in Revelation 14, 6 to 12, are messages that could only be given at the end period, during the last epochal period of Earth's history. And the rest of the Revelation, after you pass chapters 13, where we first have a discussion about the subject of the three angels' messages, and from then on to the end of Revelation, you will find till you get to the very final chapters that every chapter is devoted to telling you what will happen if you accept or reject the three angels' messages. Now, the third angel's message is a warning against worshiping the beast and his image or receiving his mark. And the Lord says, if you won't listen to this, I am going to send to you, pour out upon you, the wrath of God. You can read that in Revelation 14, verses 9 to 11. This is the way it reads in the Bible. Revelation 14, 9 to 11. It says, A third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. Now with a warning like this, you would think that every thinking person in the world in the last days would want to find out what this is about, what it is, and how to avoid coming under this condemnation. Interestingly enough, we live in a world where even with a warning like this, there are millions of people that don't pay any attention. And if you don't pay any attention, well, then the Lord says, if you don't pay any attention, this is what's going to happen. In verse 12, we have revealed to us the people that accept the three angels' messages. It's Revelation 14, 12. We just read verses 9 to 11. It says, Here is the patience of the saints. 
Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. It's interesting, isn't it, that the Bible spells out clearly that God's people, His saints, the holy people in the last days will be people who keep His commandments. Keeping the commandments is not very popular today. There are a lot of people who want to believe that uh, the Ten Commandments have been nailed to the cross and so you can do whatever you please. However, the New Testament is very, very clear on this point. You can read it from almost any one of the apostles. Here's what James says about it in James 2, verses 10 to 12. He says, For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. For he who said, Do not commit adultery, also said, Do not murder. He quotes the seventh commandment and the sixth commandment, so you cannot mistake which law he's talking about. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. Notice, the Apostle James, writing many decades after the cross, tells us that we are going to be judged by the Ten Commandment law. The Apostle Paul says the same thing. He says that actually in several different places. Notice what he says in Romans 7. Romans 7 the Apostle Paul says that, verse 7, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, You shall not covet. Notice the Apostle Paul says he wouldn't even know what sin was except for the law. The Apostle John says the same thing. He says that sin is the transgression of the law. Paul says that if there was no law, then there's no transgression. If there's no law, then there's no sin. If there's no sin, then there's no need of a gospel because the gospel is the good news of salvation from sin, both the guilt and the power of sin. The Apostle Paul says concerning those who say that they cannot keep the law, that there's a, there is a reason that they can't keep it. He says in Romans, uh, the 8th chapter and the 7th verse, The carnal mind, that's the unconverted person, is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So it's those who are not converted that cannot keep the law. If a person has given their heart, their life to Jesus Christ and chosen to follow Him, what will happen then? He says in verse 4 of the same chapter, that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. That's Romans 8, verse 4. That's what Paul says. The righteous requirement of the law will be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. He says words very similar to that in the book of Galatians. And he talks about the law all through his epistles. We just read what James says about the law. We, could, we have quoted what the Apostle John says about the law in 1 John 3. And in Revelation 14, John predicts and gives a prophecy concerning the last days. And he says, it's the last part of the third angel's message, that the people of God in the last days will be keeping His commandments. The people who receive the mark of destruction, the mark of the beast, the mark of Antichrist, will not be keeping all of God's commandments. What will happen to those in the last generation that received the mark of the beast? Well, we started studying this in a previous program. In Revelation, the 16th chapter, uh, it is predicted that the time is going to come when God is going to pour out upon this earth the seven last plagues. These seven last plagues will not come upon everybody. Some people will be protected from them. In Psalm 91, there is a prophecy about this period of time, about when the plagues fall, and here's what it says. In Psalm 91, it says, You shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor of the arrow that flies by day, nor of the pestilence that walks in darkness, nor of the destruction that lays waste at noon, day. A, th a thousand may fall at your side, and ten thousand at your right hand but it shall not come near you. Only with your eyes shall you look and see the reward of the wicked. And then he goes on to say in verse 10, that no plague will come near your dwelling. 
That's those that love God and follow Him, that keep His commandments. But for those that do not accept the three angels' messages. They do not keep the law of God because they say, well, it's not popular, it's been done away, we don't need to or we can't or whatever the excuse is. Revelation says the time's coming when God will pour out His wrath and His wrath is contained, it says in Revelation 15, in seven last plagues. And these seven last plagues fall on those who reject the third angel's message. Let's read that. In Revelation 16, verse 2, we read this before. It says, So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. So those that rejected the three angels' messages, they're the ones that will receive the seven last plagues. And we saw also about the sixth plague, which involves the battle of Armageddon. Now the sixth plague, as we mentioned before, is not actually the Battle of Armageddon. I'll read to you in just a few moments a biblical description of the Battle of Armageddon. But the sixth plague represents the drying up of the Euphrates. This is what it says about the sixth plague in Revelation 16. It says, Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up, so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons, performing signs, that is, miracles, which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief, Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place called in the Hebrew Armageddon, or Armageddon. <coughs> that is the sixth plague, the drying up of the waters of the Euphrates. You can read about it more in Revelation 17, verses 16 and 17, the drying up of the support for Babylon. And then finally, the seventh plague. When the seventh plague comes, it will be impossible for life to go on in this world. The seventh plague occurs just days before the end of the world. It will be impossible for life to go on in this world because this is the way it is described. In Revelation 16, 17 to 21, it says, Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found, and great hail from heaven fell upon men, every hailstone about the weight of a talent. And men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. It will be just like it was when the Lord poured out His wrath, when He poured out plagues long ago upon the nation of Egypt. The people of this world will finally realize, the people that have joined in this fight, the battle of Armageddon, will finally realize as God begins to deliver His people through pouring out seven last plagues upon this world that they have been deceived. And it will be a most awful experience, friend, to think that everything's all right and to wake up at the end of the world and find out that you've been deceived and that it's too late to be saved. When the plagues begin to fall, it will be too late to be saved because the final sentence will already have been pronounced from heaven. The final sentence pronounced from heaven is recorded 
In Revelation 22, 11 and 12, this is what it says. He who is unjust, let him be unjust still. He who is filthy, let him be filthy still. He who is righteous, let him be righteous still. He who is holy, let him be holy still. And behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me to give to everyone according to his work. Now that sentence has not been pronounced yet. But when that sentence is pronounced, and it will be a short time before the second coming of Christ, because the very next sentence is, I'm coming quickly. When that sentence is pronounced, then everybody in the world will have made up his mind or her mind. Whether or not they're going to keep all of God's commandments or whether they're going to receive the mark of Antichrist. And when that decision has been made by every single person in the world, whether they're going to keep all of God's commandments and receive God's seal or mark, or whether they're going to receive the mark of the beast and the mark of destruction, when that decision has been made, then the final events of world history will take place. The righteous, those who have decided to repent of sin, remember sin is breaking God's law, those that have decided to repent of sin and keep God's commandments will be delivered as a result of the plagues. And those who have re received the mark of the beast will receive the plagues, which will result shortly after the seventh plague in the final destruction of our world. Now, I promised you that I would read to you from the Bible the biblical description of the Battle of Armageddon. It's in the last chapters of the Bible. Stay tuned. We'll read it next. Sometimes studying the Bible on your own without any help or a guideline to follow can be a little difficult. And after confusion and frustration set in, we all too often turn to other things. If this sounds like you, you're not alone. The Steps to Life Bible Correspondence School is just the answer. Call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for your free Bible Correspondence Starter Pack. I really enjoy being able to study at home. I'm a new Christian and I definitely knew I needed some guidance. Simply review each lesson and answer the questions. These studies were great. It just seemed like the Bible opened up for me. Then send the completed lesson back to us in the envelope provided. These studies were very professional, they didn't take a lot of time, and I really appreciated that. A Bible teacher will then look over each lesson and send them back to you with the next set of studies. It's that simple and totally free. Call Steps to Life Television at 1-800-THE-TRUTH. I'm so glad I called. Here is a prophetic description in the Bible of the Battle of Armageddon. This is the way it reads. Then I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he who sat on him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the birds that fly in the midst of heaven, Come and gather together for the supper of the great God, that you may eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses, and of those who sit on them, and the flesh of all people, free and slave, both small and great. The, and I saw the beast, the kings of the earth, and their armies gathered together to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Then the beast was captured, and with him the false prophet, 
who worked signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who received the mark of the beast and those who worshiped his image, these two were cast alive into the lake of fire burning with brimstone. And the rest were killed with the sword which proceeded from the mouth of him who sat on the horse. And all the birds were filled with their flesh. Notice, in the battle of Armageddon, if you're on the wrong side, there will not be one person left alive. Notice what people are going to say in that time. This is Revelation 6, 14 to 17, describing the same period of time. Then the, so the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come. And who is able to stand. The seventh plague that we just read about a few minutes ago completely desolates the earth. Remember, remember it says that the cities of the nations fell. The Old Testament says that every wall will fall to the ground. It is impossible then for life to go on here. This occurs just days before the second coming of Christ. And a short time after the seventh plague, Life comes to an end in this world. The wicked have seen that they are deluded and deceived. They didn't have to be deceived, but they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved, as you read in 2 Thessalonians 2.10. When the first angel's message came to them to worship God as the Creator, they refused to obey the one that made them because they did not love the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. That's also 2 Thessalonians, the second chapter, verses 11 and 12 and 13. Because they did not obey the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. They were deceived by Antichrist at the end of the world. So what is the value, friend, of today to you? The value of today is today is the day of probation. These things we just read about haven't happened yet. Today is the time that you can change your eternal destiny. Today is the day that we have to decide to choose whether we are going to be deceived and find out that we are enemies of God fighting against Him when He comes or whether we will be found truly on His side. Today is the day that we have to choose whether we will be among those who will receive the plagues or not. Today is the day we have to choose whether we will be calling for the rocks and mountains to fall on us or whether we will be rejoicing that we are saved. Because of His great love for you and His desire for you to be saved, God sent these prophecies that we have been studying so that we could respond, so that we could love and obey Him and His law and be saved. If we reject His love, Jesus said, you don't have any life in yourself. He said that to the Jews. He said, if you don't believe that I'm the one, you will die in your sins. You do not have life in yourself. Surely we know that because we all die. We don't have life in ourselves. The person who has the Son, the Bible says, has life. This is the way it says it in 1 John, the fifth chapter, and verses 11 and 12. 1 John 5, 11 and 12 says, This is the testimony that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in His Son. He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Are you tempted to make excuses for not surrendering your will to God? and becoming obedient to all of His law. In that day, friend, that we've just read about, all excuses will come to an end. Reality will set in. 
Either you will be completely saved or you will be totally lost. The obedient will be saved. The disobedient will be lost. The ones who keep God's law will be given the inheritance of eternal life. The ones who are practicing lawlessness will be lost. So that nobody would make an, a mistake on this point. This is what Jesus said about it in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 7, 21 to 23. Jesus said, Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Oh, friend, do you get the thrust of what Jesus said? These are people who believe that they're saved. They say, we know that we're saved because we had the Holy Spirit and we were prophesying. We know we were saved, are saved because we were working miracles in your name. Jesus says, I'll say to them then, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. The Bible says that the person who lives in sin does not know the Lord. It doesn't matter what he claims, he doesn't really know the Lord. Notice what it says in 1 John 3. It says, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that He was manifested to take away our sins, and in Him there is no sin. Whoever abides in Him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen Him nor known Him. If you're living in sin, you don't know the Lord. He doesn't know you. That's what He says. He doesn't know the people who practice lawlessness. He knows who they are, but He does not have a relationship with them. He does not call them His children. Oh, friend, in that day, no theological explanation will change reality. My friend, God doesn't make mistakes. Either we will surrender our lives totally to Him and obey Him, proving that He can trust us, or else we will be deceived by the great religious revivals of the last days and be lost. Our houses, farms, cars, everything will be destroyed. The wicked will see that it's too late. They are lost, but I don't want to be among that number, do you? There will be a group of people who will be ready. This is what they will say in that day. Behold, this is our God. We have waited for Him, and He will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for Him. We will be glad and rejoice in His salvation. We pray that today's program has been a blessing to you. We'd like to send you a free book entitled The High Cost of the Cross. To receive this free book, simply call 1-800-THE-TRUTH and ask for offer ST51. How few of us understand the real meaning of Christ's suffering and death on the cross. We have only a dim comprehension of the conflict He passed through and the kind of agonizing death He experienced. Could our eyes be opened to grasp the true significance of His sacrifice? There would be more hope than many experience today. Today's free book is entitled, The High Cost of the Cross. To receive this free book, simply call 1-800-THE-TRUTH. That's 1-800-843-8788 and ask for offer ST51. We hope that this sermon has been a blessing to you. We would love to hear from you. Our mailing address is Steps to Life, P.O. Box 782-828, Wichita, Kansas 67278. You may call us at 1-800-THE-TRUTH. That's 1-800-843-8788. Our email address is historic at stepstolife.org. And our web address is www.stepstolife.org. May God be with you as you seek to walk the narrow way.